to um, talk on this rather broad subject deliberately because it is something that is occupying um, all of us one way or another. Um, and it is something that appears to defy logic, rationality, um, and anything else that we might think of. And certainly when I was thinking about the introduction to this session, um, the only place I felt I could go to do justice to uh, what's happening or what appears to be happening in the world was Alice in Wonderland. And uh, this exchange between Alice and the cat where she says, but I don't want to go among mad people. And the cat says, well, oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. I'm mad, you're mad. How do you know I'm mad, said Alice. You must be, said the cat, or you wouldn't have come here. <laughs> and this seems to me to be a particularly appropriate um, way of, of setting the scene for this evening. Um, but I will let Miles uh, take you on the journey. Um, there's another wonderful quote from Alice in Wonderland about uh, journeys and how you know uh, where you're going, but I, I will refrain from sharing that one with you. Um, so, Miles Carla, Professor Miles Carla is distinguished professor, as I say, at the School of International Service at American University. Um, American University is a particularly important uh, university for us here at the School of Government. It's one of our key international partners, and indeed, uh, we're developing um, a research program with them, uh, led both by uh, Andrew and Miles. Um, and so it's great that Miles has been able to, to come and spend a short period of time with us here at the School of Government in Melbourne. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know, uh, Miles is um, an incredibly distinguished scholar in his field, uh, the field of international uh, political economy, and has made huge contributions to that field. He sits on the board of uh, the most preeminent journal in the field, and he's also um, made significant contributions to our understanding of um, global economics, not just in uh, advanced economies, but more recently uh, in emerging e in countries. And that's where um, we've sought, certainly sought to uh, develop relationships uh, with Miles um, in terms of, of our future research. Um, he's author of a, a wide-ranging um, series of books on, on all sorts of things, and um, brings to this conversation um, a huge amount of knowledge, both academic but also uh, applied. And so um, I'm sure he will be um, both entertaining and informative uh, this evening. Um, Miles will talk for about 20 minutes, um, after which um, Andrew Walter, Professor Andrew Walter, uh, the head of the Melbourne School of Government, will give a, a short response. Um, I'm not aware if they've conferred, so um, I've no idea if... Uh, they've orchestrated what they'll be saying or whether it'll all come as a surprise. But um, in any event, um, Andrew's a, a political economist and somebody who has spent uh, a considerable amount of time um, in the UK, uh, so much so that I think he feels that he should have had um, a right to vote in the recent um, European Union uh, referendum and is indeed very disappointed at the way in which the... Um, the results played out, uh, something which I've no doubt he will share with you. Um, one of the things you may not know about Andrew is that um, in addition to being a very fine scholar, he also has a dark past as an investment banker. Um, I just leave that out there on the table for you to do with what you will. Um, but for now, um, that's uh, enough for me. You can... Uh, Store up all your questions for, for Miles and or Andrew, um, and I'll be back to, to facilitate the, uh, the discussion. But please join me in welcoming Miles Carl. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, and thanks to you and Andrew for this invitation to spend a short time here at um, the School of Government at Melbourne. And uh, I hope this brief stay, as you said, will lead to longer-term collaboration between my university uh, and yours. I want to thank you as well for rescuing me from an unprecedented heat wave on the east coast of the United States. People here have been complaining about the cold winter weather. I've loved it, every minute of it. Uh, you've also rescued me from the fevered political climate in the United States, which we're going to visit tonight. Um, I'm going to talk tonight actually not about, the, we'll come to it at the end, I hope, of the, the kind of grand macro globalization themes. Uh, I'm actually going to talk a bit about politics, which is not really my field, um, and where these movements, these 
anti-globalization populist movements are coming from a bit, and I'm going to be basing my talk on some recent papers that have appeared. Where the people are beginning to do research on these phenomena. They, they have done research on some that have been around for a long time, like the Front National in France. But Trump, obviously, is new. Brexit is a big surprise. And so the analyses are just beginning. And what I'm going to do is try to sum, summarize some of the scholarship with my own comments about it, and then we can discuss you know, where this takes us in terms of globalization. But in any case, 2016, <clears throat> as you know, as we're here tonight to discuss, was a year of political shocks, at least for the pundits. Um, shocks that followed, however, earlier trends since the global financial crisis, and even earlier than that, perhaps. So what were some of the events in the past couple of years? In uh, kind of precursor of this year, 2014, the elections to the European Parliament, the Front National, the far-right and anti-immigrant political formation in France, led the field for the first time in the elections for the European Parliament, became the largest political group from France in the European Parliament. And at the same election, UKIP, uh, the United Kingdom Independence Party, also anti-immigrant, regarded as a far-right anti-European wing of British politics, increased its representation to 27.5% of the vote in the, in the European Parliament vote also the largest group from its country in the European Parliament. Odd, because of course it's anti-European, but nevertheless. March 2016, March of this year, the Alternative for Deutschland, a far-right party in Germany, campaigned against Angela Merkel's refugee policy and won 24% of the vote in one of the state elections to become the <coughs> second largest party in that state, Saxony-Anhalt. More surprising, it won 15% of the vote in Baden-Württemberg and 12.5% in Rhineland-Palatinate, very prosperous states in the western part of Germany. This is a party that did not exist at the time of the last regional elections in 2011. May 2016, the candidate of the Green Party in Austria, uh, Alexander van den Beilen, Beilen ver barely defeated the far-right candidate for presidency of Austria, the, the representative of the Freedom Party, who ran on a platform similar to these other groupings, anti-immigrant, uh, far-right nationalist, um, populist, and um, nearly won. Uh, as I said, the Green candidate, uh, the, the representative of the Green Party barely beat him. The election has been annulled and it will be rerun on October 6th of this year. What's interesting is the two big mainstream parties that have dominated Austria's politics since 1945 did not even make it through the first round of the presidential election this time. And of course, the two events that are the title of the talk tonight, June 23rd of this year, the UK voted to leave the European Union by a margin of 51.9% to 48.1% in a very high turnout election. And I should say the European Parliament elections are very low turnout elections, but not the Brexit election. It was 72% turnout. And an issue that 15 years ago was regarded as a fringe issue in British politics won the referendum. And finally, on July 19th of this year, just last month, Donald Trump, the ultimate political outsider in American politics, was nominated as a candidate for president by one of the two major parties in the United States, running on a platform that deviated from the conservative mainstream of his party in that it was anti-trade, including NAFTA and TPP, as well as hostility toward the WTO, hostility toward immigration, questioning of traditional U.S. alliances dating from the Cold War, and a notable fan of Vladimir Putin, um, uh, but also an economic populist in many respects. His economic uh, program that he presented last week uh, goes back a little bit more toward the Republican mainstream, but essentially on things like entitlement programs, he's very favorable to those, he's favorable to government spending, he's big on infrastructure, so in that respect, an economic populist as well. And he was matched during the campaign in anti-trade rhetoric on the left by the unsuccessful candidacy of Bernie Sanders. So uh, the globalization theme was common to both of their campaigns, or anti-globalization. So the common threads of these movements, and they're all in the industrialized world, of course, are that they combine hostility toward economic globalization, trade in the case of the United States, immigration everywhere, with redistribution and anti-austerity policies, Trump in part, uh, certainly Sanders in the United States, labor supporters of Brexit, but not all Brexit supporters, and distrust of government and elites, uh, as well as nationalism and in Europe, an anti-EU or an anti-European integration stance. Populism is a very hard term to define. Political scientists have populations that range all over the map about it, but those are the sort of themes that one associates with populist movements, typically, especially right-wing or nationalist populist movements. Hostility to the political mainstream, both left and right, 
and a willingness to reshuffle political programs against that conventional right-left divide, and a clear link to various dimensions of globalization. Hostility to economic integration, as I've mentioned, hostility to liberalized trade and investment, and above all, hostility to immigration. Now, cautions, however, before I go any further, they're not the same movements, and I will mention in my remarks some of the differences among these movements. Um, they often aggregate different groups, disparate groups within their coalitions, which do not agree on many issues. Their supporters may just be protest voters. Uh, even the Leave voters for the, in the Brexit referendum did not think they were going to win. Uh, they thought it was going to be a protest vote in many cases. And some of the results are highly dependent on particular electoral rules. So in the case of Brexit, of course, a referendum on 50% plus one was a very unwise step if you really wanted the United, United Kingdom to remain in the European Union. Trump's victory in the United States was very much dependent on the primary rules that were put in place by the Republican Party, ironically, to consolidate support for a mainstream candidate in the electoral cycle, but Trump took advantage of those rules. And of course, low turnout in many cases, though not in the case of Brexit. And finally, there are geographical limits. We should not make this sound like it's a, a, wave, a, a global wave. Um, it's limited to rich industrialized countries, particularly in Northern Europe. In Mediterranean Europe, in fact, the left anti-mainstream movements have been as powerful as the right, such as Syriza in Greece. And it didn't, there's no sign of this in Canada, for example, where recently the Liberal Party, which is the ultimate mainstream party, forged a stunning comeback under Justin Trudeau last year in October 2015. And no evidence of such a backlash in Japan either, at least not at the current moment. So, and I'll come back to the developing world where anti-globalization politics is not a particular powerful strand. So it's a limited in geographical scope, and we have to think, keep in mind those limits and try to explain uh, why they exist. So, I want to look a little bit at what the basis of these movements are, and then we can come back to uh, what their effects are likely to be, trying to explain them, and then what their effects are likely to be. Um, the voters for the, in these movements, and, and most of the analysis I'm going to present is of voters who have voted for these movements, are older, they're less educated, the major divide in almost each of the, every one of these cases is whether you have a university degree or not. <clears throat> Typically working class or lower middle class in terms of occupation. Men more than women, although that's not the case in every one of these movements. Members of ethnic majorities rather than minorities. Uh, these are not exclusive categories, but they are categories that cut across many of these movements. So let's look at some of these. This is the Brexit results, uh, which you've seen, 51 to 48, and the regional breakdown, uh, which I'll come back to, because I think location is extremely important in explaining these movements. But this is a, an interesting, this was done by, uh, from the, on the basis of exit polls from Brexit. And uh, I'm not sure if I have a laser pointer here. Let me see, yes, I do. Uh, so basically, this is, is asking, um, of the people who voted for Remain, how did they vote in the general election vote 2015? And what you can see here is there is a rightward tilt to the Leave group, which is conservative, and of course UKIP, 25% was UKIP supporters in 2015. Um, but nevertheless, the Remain vote is also divided between conservative and labor. So in some sense, it splits the mainstream parties. Um, the, what might be called the cultural left, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, are very much in the Remain group. And UCAP, of course, is in the, uh, is in the almost solidly uh, a member of the, uh, of the Leave group. But it's the mainstream parties that are divided. And it's this labor, this labor group which surprised people, the labor group which is in Leave. 21% uh, of the Leave voters voted labor in the previous election, which was an unexpectedly large labor contribution. And this is the demographics. Um, you can see here. Um, by more degree educated. It's a pretty clear relationship there. The leave vote is the less educated part of the electorate. And the age distribution also fairly clear. Uh, older voters tended to vote remain, um, uh, tended to vote leave, and younger voters tended to vote uh, remain. And one of the demographics that had the highest proportion of supporters for remain were university students, which combines those two, uh, two categories. Um, so education and age are important. 
Um, Trump voters in the United States, very similar. They tend to identify as conservatives in political terms, so they're more like the conservative voters here uh, than the labor voters. They're older. Uh, higher household incomes than most voters in a broad sample in the United States, so we'll come back to that. These are not, these are not the poor uh, or the displaced in many cases. They're more likely to be male. They're more likely to be white, non-Hispanic voters. They're less likely to have university degrees. They're more likely to work in blue-collar occupations, and they're much more likely to be retired than other voters. Uh, so as you can see, there's a certain similarity between some aspects of the Brexit electorate, those who voted for leave, and the, and the Trump electorate. Now, how do we explain this? And here's the, here's the demographics in more detail for Britain. Uh, what I would point out in this slide, this is also from the exit polls, is down here, the occupational categories. The only occupational category that voted majority remain is higher level managerial and professional. That's the AB. These are categories used in survey research in Britain. Uh, C1 is uh, skilled work, um, sorry, that's uh, white collar, essentially white collar workers. They're evenly split. These are manual working class, C2, large majority for leave. And the, the DE is retired people who are not in the workforce and unskilled manual workers. As you can see, nearly two thirds of these categories voted for, uh, for leave. So what are the explanations? And I'll go through these fairly quickly. One, inequality. So this is all about people who are losing from globalization. And they're the people who are voting for leave in the case of Brexit. They're the people who are the electors who are voting for Trump in the United States. And for the far right populist parties who are anti-European in Europe. Second sort of explanation is identity. And this, of course, is linked to the issue of immigration, which is a major theme in all of these movements. Insecurity, uh, an emphasis on crime and terrorism. Uh, loss of status and cultural backlash, which is linked in many ways to the identity explanations, uh, but also to gender. And location, I'll come back to that because I think this one is, is underestimated, and the experience of living in an area in decline as compared to a vibrant, up-and-coming, reinvented, globalized setting. And then I'll come back and talk briefly about globalization in the developing world. So on the issue of inequality, some of you may have seen this this diagram, the famous elephant diagram by Branko Milanovic. His book came out this spring. It's a really interesting book. I think on inequality, it's much more interesting than Piketty's more famous book. Um, but what he's diagramming here is percentile of global income distribution. So this is the global distribution of inequality and, and, and growth in income between 1988 and 2008, the era of high globalization. Um, and which, which percentiles of the global income distribution uh, showed real increases, large, small, otherwise, in their income over this period of time. So you can see where the big gains are. They are here, which is the global middle class, but that's not the middle class in the industrialized countries. That is the middle class and lower middle class in China and India, basically. This is Asia, essentially, within the global income distribution, and you can see how well they have done in the three decades of globalization. This is the working class in the industrialized countries, in the United States, in North America, and in Europe, in Australia, I presume, as well. And as you can see, during the period of globalization, they have not done well. In fact, their incomes have been stagnant, and in some cases, even negative in real terms. And then you can see one other group that has done extremely well, which is the global 1%. Um, and this is, obviously, a fairly high-income group in the industrialized countries, but this is the global 1%, so many of the people in this room would be in that category as well. So these would be highly paid professionals, managers, and others in the industrialized countries. Looking at that chart, you can see an obvious possible explanation for what we're, the phenomenon I've been talking about, which is this. So these are, the, these are the groups that have not benefited from globalization. The interesting question is, have they actually suffered from globalization or not? In other words, are they voting for Trump and Brexit because they have um, suffered uh, from trade competition, from the emerging economies, or from other aspects of globalization like immigration. And this is a fairly familiar theme in trade economics. We know that not everyone wins from open trade. Some people lose, relatively speaking. And as you would expect, as trade booms with emerging economies like China, the workers in the industrialized countries that are going to be most severely affected are less skilled workers, not highly paid managers. 
So the argument is the Trump phenomenon, Brexit, especially the Trump phenomenon, and, and the votes for Bernie Sanders as well in the United States are based on those workers who have been disadvantaged uh, by globalization. Now, the Brexit vote's a little more complicated, but for the labor voters in the Brexit coalition, which as I, saw, as I pointed out to you was a fairly critical part in Bre Brexit winning in that referendum, uh, one could argue also that they have been uh, from economically distressed areas, areas that have not done well from European integration or from global integration over a period of time. But what's more puzzling about this argument, um, and somehow, somehow runs counter to it, is evidence that despite the image of Trump voters in the United States as workers displaced by trade, uh, a recent study by Jonathan Rothwell of Gallup suggests that individually Trump voters are not below average in income. In fact, they're slightly above average in income, even though they are blue collar, generally speaking. And they don't display most indicators of direct economic distress when they're compared even to other Republican voters. Nor are they more likely to be unemployed. Um, and most significant, he discovered that Trump's support falls as exposure to trade and immigration increases, which is the opposite of the predicted relationship if it is indeed globalization that is causing this discontent. So there are some problems with a simple explanation linked directly to globalization for these phenomena. Um, and one figure I will give to you from this Gallup survey, which came out literally this week, it's very, very new and it's very, very good in terms of the detail that it's able to present about voters, especially voters for Trump. 14% of Hispanics and African Americans view Trump favorably, and that rises to exactly 16% among those groups in blue collar occupations. So in other words, being working class African American or Hispanic in the United States does not make you very pro-Trump. 16% is very, very low. So that leads to a second explanation, which I mentioned, and that is identity and immigration. Immigration has always been the weak link in globalization. It was in the first period of globalization before 1914, and it is today. Immigrants are convenient scapegoats for those who are economically uh, disadvantaged or uh, feel that they are being hurt by globalization or other economic changes. Um, it's easier to use than trade, and it certainly was central to the Brexit debate and the current European surge in right-wing movements and to the Trump campaign. Um, in his foreign policy speech, which he gave just yesterday, Trump once again came back to a new form of identity vetting, ideological vetting to keep out certain groups from entering the United States. So once again, this idea of those outside who are a threat to those inside on economic and other grounds. So this leads to another possible explanation, which is identity. And this is a, this is a slide based also on the exit polls by Lord Ashcroft. Um, the interesting figure here, well, it, it gets at a whole set of cultural issues, identity issues, rather than economic issues. So, of those people who thought the following in his exit survey were a force for ill, in other words, they're a bad thing, how did they vote on Brexit? Well, blue is, bre is, is leave. So if you thought multiculturalism is bad, 81% voted for, for leave. And you can go right down the list of cultural, kind of what you might call the cultural left here. And you can see, but look at immigration. So if you thought immigration was a bad thing, 80% of those individuals voted for leave. If you thought immigration was positive, which is this force for good, 79% voted to remain in uh, the European Union. So you can see that for these voters, immigration and a whole range of other cultural issues, if you will, were quite important in it may not be important to vote necessarily, but it certainly is important in the way they view the world and in the, the attitudes they bring to politics. Um, so cultural conservatives, uh, and this is an argument made by Ron Englehart and Pippa Norris in a recent paper, uh, also just appeared this month. Uh, cultural conservatives or a backlash by cultural conservatives is part of what is going on in these populist movements, and this has been going on since the 1960s and 1970s. Um, now, it's important to note, however, and this comes from the, uh, the Rothwell paper, Trump voters do not live in high immigration areas. Uh, Trump voters, in fact, tend to be isolated from immigration and live in low, low diversity locations. So uh, what Rothwell discovers in his analysis of the American electorate in this campaign season is the strong support for the contact view 
uh, of positive views of those who are ethnically different from oneself. In other words, if you live in an area like London, for example, which has large numbers of immigrants, you would tend to vote for Remain, and you would tend to have positive views of immigration. Uh, the Trump voters may have strong views about immigration, but they don't see a lot of immigrants. They don't deal a lot with immigrants because they live in areas that are fairly isolated uh, from immigrants. I'll show you another slide here. Oh, no, this is the regional slide. I'll come back to that. Um, so on the other side, a lot of immigrant and ethnic minority populations were heavily supporting supporters of Remain, and that's fairly clear from the exit surveys. And of course, as I've already mentioned, hostility to Trump by immigrants and racial minorities in the United States. And this also fits with the education variable, because education has economic, but also cultural consequences. Third possible explanation is insecurity, um, crime and terrorism, which Donald Trump has linked clearly to the immigration theme in his most recent foreign policy speech, as I've mentioned. But I think since 9-11, especially in the United States, adding insecurity to the cultural theme of immigration has given it a particular charge uh, politically, and Trump has played upon that. If you look at his acceptance speech at the Republican convention in July, you would think the streets of America were running with blood from the level of crime and, uh, and violence that he was portraying in the society. So playing upon misperceptions of risk and the threat of crime and terrorism, although not directly linked to actual terrorism, of which there's been relatively little in the United States, um, is another trope within the populist uh, movements that I've been describing. But let me go to the location issue, because I think this is very important. In many ways, the new cleavage that is emerging is what might be called metropolitan cosmopolitans versus rural and small cities, rural areas and small cities that are in relative economic decline. Um, world cities, if you will, that are tightly linked into the global economy, like London, versus hinterland, which is not linked and has not been reinventing itself for a globalized era. And I think these locational effects are very important because politics ultimately is territorial. Uh, and it does matter where people live. It also matters in terms of their attitudes. So if you look at the slide of Brexit and the vote for remain and leave, it's a pretty clear pattern. First of all, pretty clear pattern is most of England, and it's important to note that a lot of the, the uh, leave supporters in Brexit identify themselves as English, not British. Uh, most of England goes for leave very heavily. Uh, Scotland, as you all know, voted Remain, which is going to create problems for the United Kingdom, and Northern Ireland also voted for Remain, but Wales did not. Um, but look at the pattern here, and I can identify some of these for you. You can see London, clearly, in the southeast. London was the core of the, uh, of the Remain coalition. But around London, you have the stockbroker belt, where Andrew might have lived when he worked for the investment bank. Um, so that these, these rather wealthy counties, but up here, what do you think that is? You can probably identify. Cambridge, absolutely, and Oxford, and the area around Oxford, so the two big university towns. In fact, I looked at the list of constituencies, and you, the only university town that did not vote for Remain was Durham, as far as I know. So Exeter, uh, you just go around the country. Also, cities that have been reinventing themselves in the north, like Manchester and Liverpool, which are actually doing reasonably well, voted for Remain. Uh, but this area, which is heavily industrial, was 50, 60 percent for leave, okay? So Birmingham, Bradford, Rochdale, all the old cities, if you've studied economic history and the Industrial Revolution, uh, that have been in steep decline for many decades, all went uh, very much for uh, leave. And look at the United States map. Now, you would think, how did Obama win a, an electoral majority with that map? These are by counties. Blue is Obama, red was Romney in the last election. Well, as you can see, it's because the Obama coalition is heavily, heavily based in metropolitan areas, um, along the coast in particular, uh, but also around the Great Lakes, Chicago and the, and the upper Midwest, uh, and then also uh, areas that are populated by ethnic minorities, such as these largely African-American counties in the American South. And that's the, that's the current coalition of the left in the United States, this is showing it in a slightly more modified form, blue merging to red and purple. Um, but once again, the same, the same feature of metropolitan versus uh, old economy uh, areas that have, as one observer put it, 
non-urban, blue-collar, and now apparently quite angry population in the United States. These are the Trump voters. They're not people who have moved around a lot and things have been changing away from them, but they live in areas that feel stagnant in a lot of ways. Okay? So they're not areas that are reinventing themselves. They're not areas that are connected to the global economy. They're not always areas that are being affected negatively by the global economy either. Uh, but they're just not doing well economically um, relative to the rest of the country. Just to give you another example, oh, I, I wanted to mention this. This is uh, from an earlier article about Trump voters connecting co what counties were voting heavily for Trump in the primaries. Um, counties that have large numbers of mobile homes, counties that are old economy jobs, including agriculture, construction, manufacturing, trade, and the like. Um, and there's some other interesting features here. No high school diploma. Um, history of voting for segregationists in the past. That was another protest movement in 1968, those who voted for George Wallace. But this is the French case. I'm not going to talk about France at length because it's too complicated, but I just want to point out that the, the Front National and Marine Le Pen is among the European right-wing populist movement is the rising star. There's no question. She will undoubtedly be at least in the first round of the presidential elections in France next year. Um, Marine Le Pen and the Front National used to be based here in the south. You can see these dark, these are the, the cantons where the Front National got the, the darker is higher Front National votes in the European elections in 2014. This used to be the core support in the south. This was often associated with the fact that many of the Algerian colons had traveled to the south of France when Algeria received independence and brought very right-wing views with them. But now Marine Le Pen has, de has built a bastion of Front National support here in the northeast of France, which is heavily industrialized. These used to be, these used to be socialist strongholds, and now they're voting heavily for the Front National. Okay, so these are declining, once again, declining industrial areas like Lille, Roubaix, Turquoise, uh, that, that used to be industrial powerhouses but are uh, no more. Final explanation is status and the decline of white males. Uh, that is a big issue, I think, among Trump voters. Uh, there is not a big gender gap on Brexit voting, but in the case of the Trump electorate, there's a very, as, as Trump himself would say, a huge gender gap. Um, and in many of these right-wing populist movements, though not all, uh, there is an issue of the decline in status of majority population males over time and dealing with some of these cultural issues that have grown since the 1960s. Um, now, briefly, the emerging economies. Populism in the emerging economies is rather different. In Latin America at the moment, populism is in retreat. Um, and Venezuela being the most prominent case of that. But more clearly, the attitudes toward globalization are very, very different. And these are the results of surveys done by the Pew Research Center in Washington, which they do over a period of years. These were done two years ago. But it's quite striking that the skepticism about global economic engagement is much, much higher in the industrialized countries than it is in the emerging economies. So on the question of whether trade destroys jobs, for example, the global median is 19%, but in France it's 49%, in Italy it's 59%, and in the US it's 50%. Uh, and you could look at these other globalization types of questions. This is the trend in American opinions on trade and whether growing trade and business ties with other countries are a good thing over time. And as you can see, the country median, the international median is 76%. And in the US, after dipping during the recession to 53%, it has gone back to only 68%. Still positive, but clearly not as positive as it once was. And here you can see um, another set of bar graphs with the advanced countries being the darkest, uh, emerging economies being in the middle, and developing countries, which are the group of countries that are somewhat poorer than the middle income emerging economies, the, the gray bar graph. And you can see the developing economies in, in particular are very positive, or much more positive about globalization and global economic benefits than the industrialized or even the emerging economies as well. So, how big an alarm should all of this be? These are movements that are, they've been around some of them for some time. The Front National has been around for some time. They're doing better now than they used to. None of them have taken power at this point. Um, there have been protest movements like this in the past, such as Ross Perot in the early 1990s in the United States or George Wallace in 1968. 
Um, well, you could sort of set this aside asking whether this time is different uh, or not. I think the slow recovery from the global financial crisis in Europe and in the United States means that these movements are going to have staying power. There's the prospects of continuing slow growth unless productivity rises uh, are apparent in Europe and the United States, which is not the case right now. There's the threat of further technological change, which may eliminate even more uh, occupations and professions that have not been hurt by trade up to this point. But I think what concerns me the most is the susceptibility of the global economy and the national economies in the industrialized world to shocks of various kinds. We don't have a lot of latitude to respond to shocks of the kind that occurred in 2007, 2008, 2009. And the industrialized countries, after all, are those that have supported the global economic and political order. And you can imagine if a populist movement of this kind, and think of Trump's views on foreign policy, takes power or even influences policy as the Brexit, as UKIP did, leading up to the Brexit referendum, uh, that could create real problems for support um, and leadership in the global economic and political order. So finally, what can, be, what can be done? Well, think about the different explanations, and you can come up or try to come up, and I hope we will discuss some of the possible remedies. Economic insecurity, there's a debate that is finally opening, I think, in the United States and the other industrialized countries about how to deal with the new economy that is emerging, a new globalized economy, and whether the existing welfare state policies are adequate for that. Um, opening the U.S. economy to tra trade with China over the last decade, the so-called China shock, which trade economists are now analyzing, without putting in place policies of this kind, was probably a disaster for the, for the localities that were hit hardest by trade competition. Wage insurance, active labor market policies, raising savings rates, there are a number of things that can be done. But whether governments have the will to do that, given the experience of the last two decades of globalization, is a big question. On the issue of identity, it seems active policies of integration are necessary. Policies that address surges in, in, in immigration with active public policies and, above all, public expenditures to assist localities that deal with these increases that may be disproportionate relative to the rest of the country. Third, making the internationalist case to those who are skeptical, not preaching to the converted. And this is a place where I think universities and those many of us in this room have really not done a very good job. Um, we know that walls, building walls are delusions and that unilateral action will often be ineffective even for a large economy like the United States. But that case has to be made and it has to be made not to people who already believe that but people who don't believe that. And su successful internationalization at every level requires a lot of hard work. Um, finally, in terms of political coalitions, it seems to me um, both sides of the political spectrum, as currently defined right and left, are facing real problems from these phenomena. So in the United States, and I think other conservative parties like the British conservatives face a problem in that um, the business elite, which tends to be dominant within those right-wing coalitions, is now facing a populist revolt, which really doesn't believe in the program that they've been advancing, including a pro-globalization program, for decades. And on the left, we have coalitions which have emphasized cultural left issues, identity issues, and basically in many ways have neglected economic issues over time. And now they are facing the fact that many of their core constituents, like the labor voters who voted for leave and Brexit, uh, who don't really respond to those types, not that they're not important, but they're not what people who are concerned about economic insecurity and globalization are going to respond to. And finally, it requires leadership. And here I would point to, <clears throat> to one individual, Angela Merkel, who stands out in this rather dreary political panorama of the last year uh, for not just expressing shock and dismay, but making the case for internationalist policies over and over again at great political cost to herself. And one can only hope that we will have political leaders of that caliber uh, as we deal with these problems in the decades ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Miles. Um, I completely failed in my uh, duty as chair, but I'm sure you'll agree that was a, a fascinating um, analysis. Um, Andrew, can you just 
kick us off with some thoughts of uh, mm. uh, reflections on, on what, what you've heard, and then we'll open for questions. Mm, sure. So I might stay here, seeing I don't have slides, um, but thanks also, Miles, for a really interesting uh, overview. Um, I guess one thing that strikes me, um, particularly coming as as I as like. Uh, as I do, like you, Miles, um, from a background in international political economy, international relations, that that trying to grapple with what I, I think is one is going to be and, and is already one of the great political uh, political economy policy challenges of our time really requires uh, a great deal of interdisciplinarity that none of us have really been well equipped for. So some of us are having to go back to our political science degrees and so on in the past, not thinking about international relations and political economy as a kind of separate domain of inquiry. But if we think about it, we really need uh, also to be economists, uh, social policy analysts, uh, education um, analysts, uh, migration experts, um, and all sorts of other things, geographers as well, I guess. Uh, that's one general thought. Um, one, another is that, um, as Helen referenced uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, book at the beginning, and uh, the notion of madness, I guess another synonym, synonym for madness is anger, uh, which Miles touched on. Um, and that conjures up notions of righteous anger, uh, justified anger. Um, and uh, those of us who are, who are wedded to more rationalist kinds of explanations might tend towards that kind of, um, uh, or an interest in that kind of anger, but also uh, passionate uh, uh, anger of the kind that Adam Smith and others talked about when distinguishing the passions from rational interests and so on. And so I think that too is uh, very much at the heart of what's going on and, and the difficulty of many social scientists trying to understand uh, precisely uh, what's going on in these, um, in these electoral patterns. Um, I guess at least for purposes of debate and opening up debate, um, uh, Miles mentioned uh, towards the beginning that, um, that the globalization backlash to the extent that it's happening in places like Britain and the United States is not a universal backlash. It's not happening in, um, in some important parts of the world, Japan and, and elsewhere, uh, China um, so far. Um, I guess what I would say is um, I think it's, it's really quite revealing and important that it's happening in the two cheerleader countries of globalization and indeed of the globalization project as it really began in the post-Cold War period in the, in the early 1990s, the United States and Britain really at the forefront, leading what I would call the globalization project uh, from the front and sometimes imposing it or attempting to impose it on others. So it's quite revealing. I think it's also um, in a way reflective of... Um, some rather acute policy crises that have become, that were very concentrated in these two particular countries, and what I would think of as a kind of uh, more chronic, ongoing policy crisis that both have been particularly, uh, um, well, I, I think both have failed in a way to grapple with, and that, that one is dealing with inequality, whatever um, its causes and consequences, inequality and economic insecurity, I guess. The two acute policy crises are, I think, which are relevant here, um, the Iraq war first, um, which helped, was the first killer blow, uh, I think, to the globalization project. Tony Blair was the great uh, liberal interventionist, of course, imposing democracy uh, on the Middle East. Um, uh, one of the deputy sheriffs um, of George W. Bush uh, in that neoconservative project. That also, I think, um, powerfully undermined um, the notion of expertise um, and uh, key agencies associated with uh, policy experts in one particular policy domain. Then the second acute policy crisis, which I guess uh, also reflected a kind of uh, chronic ongoing policy failure in the area of financial re regulation, uh, was of course the global financial crisis, which had a similar effect, I think, knocked uh, the second leg out uh, from underneath uh, the globalization project, and particularly Blair's version of it and Brown's um, association with it in the UK. Um, but also, you know, the whole Clintonite third way project with which Blair, Brown and others were, were also strongly associated. So 
if they couldn't get right liberal interventionism and that particular plank of the globalization project and they couldn't also manage uh, globalization and particularly its, its financial aspects, um, then of what use really were they for large, um, I think, chunks of the British electorate um, and increasingly also the American electorate? Add on to that, um, whatever the causes, complex as they no doubt are and, and contested as they no doubt are, whatever the causes of inequality and increasing uh, perceptions of economic insecurity amongst large swathes of the American population and the British population, as is revealed um, in the Brexit vote um, that Miles went through in some detail, Whatever the causes, um, the inability of both states, I think, effectively to deal um, with those consequences um, have really come home to roost in both countries. Um, so um, the British state um, rejecting um, uh, various European uh, globalization adjustment funds that were available um, uh, because of a concern that this wouldn't look good, uh, that, that that would portray Europe too positively as a source of uh, adjustment buffer, if you like, of the kind that Marx talked about, uh, the kinds of adjustment policies that may be necessary to sustain political support uh, in favor of globalization. Um, but uh, education policy and all the sorts of other policy areas um, that Miles uh, touched on at the end, I think the British and the American state have done a particularly poor job uh, compared to some, particularly, of course, compared to the Scandinavians, uh, but also even compared to the Japanese, uh, the Germans and others. Um, so I think not surprising really that the chickens have come home to roost in these two particular countries led uh, liberal interventionism, uh, led by neoconservatives, of course, in the United States, but also by uh, mad liberals like uh, Blair, mad internationalists like Blair um, in the 1990s and the 2000s. It's not surprising, but also very important, as Miles says, for global economic leadership going forward um, in the future, because those two countries The other thing I'd say uh, finally is that the institutional, the domestic institutional domain or systems in which policy is made and the kinds of policy responses that Miles talked about at the end, um, I think these are really important. Um, classically, you know, political uh, scientists talking about a system um, with very strong checks and balances in the United States have talked about the weak presidency. Strong abroad, perhaps, in foreign policy terms, and that's where Trump could make most difference if he were um, very unlikely now to gain the presidency, but if he did. Um, Hillary may make a big difference vis-a-vis -vis Obama, too. Much more of a, an American exceptionalist, uh, much more robust, seen as a hawk in place but in domestic policy terms, even Hillary is going to be weak, so she's going to be substantially constrained. I agree that she's going to be talking much more about economic in, uh, insecurity and the need to deal with it, and social insecurity as well, but she's going to be much more limited than um, in a much more centralized Westminster-style system that really centralizes power, much more constrained in her ability to deliver on this project than uh, Theresa May, um, I think, who at least... Uh, potentially um, talking more about, you know, being a one-nation Tory, grappling with uh, the social and economic exclusion that Miles referenced. However, what we're seeing in both countries is the collapse of oppositions. I think, you know, there's a good chance that the Republican Party um, will continue um, in a state of disarray for some years yet after this, uh, after the crisis, the internal party crisis of Trump. Um, and the inability, the chronic inability to deal with um, many of the forces that they've unleashed uh, really since Reagan. Um, and at home in Britain, um, not my home anymore, but, um, uh, but in Britain, um, the disarray of the Labour Party, their chronic inability really, I think, um, to come up with any solution, any alternative. Um, what's the Labour Party left with? A kind of anti-Blairist pacifism and a return to old socialist nostrums. Um, they're really, uh, I think, grappling uh, with an inability to deal with the challenges of globalization. Okay. Thanks. So, thank you, Andy, for cheering us up. Um, I'm going to open it to questions now, and I'm, I'm very conscious of the time, um, but it would be remiss of me not to remark, and I'm surprised neither of our presenters have, that. Um,
uh, one of the things that um, is being commented on is that you know things have got really, really, really awful, and so consequently we have the emergence of female leaders. <laughs> How strange is that? No, and the trouble with horrible. that, of course, yeah. is that it only works until you think about if you take Andrew's analysis of the cheerleaders for, for neoliberalism, of course, Thatcher was one of those, so it doesn't really hold. But anyway, I thought I'd mention it. So, questions? Who'd like to start? Yes. One factor that neither of you mentioned, I was, was the influence of particular individuals on the way things were built. And I wonder if you'd like to say something briefly about, for example, how important is it that the National Front has a particularly you know, telegenic leader in Marine Le Pen? How important is it that Boris Johnson decided not to go for the Tory leadership? Would would the same factors throw up the same results in the absence of those particular people, or have they had a critical influence at times? Okay, I'm going to take a couple of questions just in the interest of time. So, anybody? Yep, Tim, and then Hans. Tim. <laughs> My question is is, is this what Hans has outlined the emergence of identity politics but for white people? Um, worked in the university, you've become very adept at how identity politics has legitimacy um, for non-whites. Is, it, is this the attempt by whites to actually claim that their identity politics matters, matters, matters as well? Um, okay, Hans. Uh, yeah, Miles, I'd like to hear you say something about left-wing populism in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Bernie Sanders basically talked about the billionaire class. Mm -hmm. uh, politicians in the U.S. don't like to talk about class warfare. Mm -hmm. He talked about the need for political revolution. And now you have literally millions of young Americans calling themselves socialists, whatever right. that might be. Right. Uh, whereas four or five years ago, the Tea Party was calling Obama a socialist, when he's probably barely a, a, a moderate. And even though Bernie is sort of out of the picture, uh, I think we have to think of a kind of post-Bernie phenomenon, particularly among many of those young people as well as young women. So okay. Okay. What? Go where you will. Okay. Uh, leadership. That's, well, that's a big issue for political scientists. has been for a long time. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Andrew on that. <laughs> but I would point out one interesting feature, given what Helen has just said that um, one, of the, one of the movements that does not have a gender gap is the Front National, and it may well be because Marie Le Pen is the leader. So it's, it's interesting to contemplate what if, what if the Trump movement had been led by a woman instead of Donald Trump, and the gender gap were not so large. Uh, yeah, I, I see people shuddering around the room, but nevertheless, um, it, it, I think in some respects, leaders do have an effect on things like that. There are questions of style. Uh, there are questions of rhetoric, which do make a difference. I mean, the Republican Party has not coalesced around Donald Trump uh, to the degree that it should have by now, partly because of things he says and the style he portrays. And it is, it is clear from the survey evidence that one group in particular that is put off by his style is suburban Republican women, right, who are not because of his views necessarily, they might, they might not like his views, but because of the way he, he portrays himself in his kind of this abrasive, um, unpredictable style. It's not the way they want to see a leader behave. So I think there are questions of real interesting questions of a leadership style that, that can make a difference. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned Port Boris Johnson. I mean, the, the, the calls that leaders make at particular points in time. Cameron's call for a referendum because he was solving a a problem within the Conservative Party. I mean, in many ways, all this didn't have to happen um, in any case. Andy, did you want to say more about leadership? Or? Yeah, it's always a difficult one. I suspect people will be debating uh, this one for decades ahead, um, and it's probably too early to tell. Um, I do think that Boris could well have tipped the vote, um, and uh, his decision was very consequential, I think. Um, I mean, if you look at the other lead figures in the, in the Leave campaign, um, Nigel Farage um, and Michael Gove. I don't know if you've ever seen Michael Gove, but uh, you know he's the worst kind of Oxbridge uh, Etonian Tory. And 
um, if they didn't have a charismatic front man, I think that really did help the, mm -hmm. uh, the Leave campaign quite substantially. Um, and quite surprising how um, so many people, I watched a BBC documentary last night, and so many working class people who you wouldn't normally associate or think would be attracted by Etonians like Boris. I went to university with him, happened to know him. Um, uh, yeah, it's really quite extraordinary, his, his ability to reach out to those disaffected working class people who, who feel as though they're not, they're constantly saying, we have not been listened to for the past three decades. Why do they think Boris is talking for them? I, it's an extraordinary political Trump, ability. Right? So I, I think uh, he has a unique ability and I don't think any of the others did. Um, Trump, however, I'm not sure. I think, you know, history throws up uh, people at certain points in time to take advantage of, you know, structural conditions. I guess that's a kind of structuralist answer to that kind of leadership question. 